Hi everyone, this is Dr. A with your clinical chemistry one lesson on body fluids and electrolytes. All right, so we're going to start with a case like we uh, do now. So this is George's case. So George is a 72-year-old man that was brought to the ER in a confused mental state. He has type 2 diabetes and has recently fallen in his kitchen about two days ago. Um, and was unable to get up. He had nothing to eat or drink for two days. The physicians diagnosed him with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. So this is a complication of type 2 diabetes where the patient is hyperosmolar, meaning usually severely dehydrated, hyperglycemic. Their blood sugar is high because of the stress state that they're in. And then non-ketotic, uh, they just don't have any ketones usually because they're not type 1 diabetic. Uh, and it's usually, um, there's usually enough sugar around to prevent the formation of ketones. So uh, in this case, if this was your patient that was brought to the ER, um, which chemistry results do you think are going to be abnormal? All right, so we can answer that here. So select all of the ones that you think are likely to be abnormal. So a choice is going to be sodium, potassium, glucose, ketones, and osmolality. All right, so let's talk about some fluid facts. First of all, the human body is 60% water. Blood is 83% water. And uh, we have physical barriers to keep water inside, such as your skin and your mucous membranes. And the distribution of maintenance of water is maintained by uh, electrolyte concentration gradients so and pressure gradients. Um, and so this has to do with, you know, how much sodium and potassium, and but also other uh, things such as a BUN and uh, glucose and um, other molecules, how they are distributed between the cells and the fluids that are around the cells and the fluids that are in the cardiovascular system. All right, so your first question on the poll, who do you think has the highest percentage of body water? Um, and so female, males are females, females are males. Um, and this would be like if you, you know, compared a male and female of, you know, average size, uh, you know, pretty similar. Who of the two, who would have the highest percentage of body water? And for that, actually, the answer is going to be males because they have higher muscle masses and muscles hold more water. So uh, your, let's talk about the body fluid compartment. So these are all the places that you can find body fluids or in, therefore, these are all the places that water can move in and out of. So you have your intravascular compartment, which is going to be your lymphatic system and your cardiovascular system, so lymph and blood. So all the lymph capillaries and lymph vessels, and then your arteries, capillaries, and veins, and of course your heart and cardiovascular system. Then um, from there, water can move from, so inside, from your blood or your lymphatics to um, the extravascular compartment, so this is outside of the vascul vasculature, and in there you have intracellular, so water can move inside the cells, or extracellular outside of the cells. So this is the fluid that's around the cells, like interstitial uh, fluid. This is also interstitial spaces, the fluid between the cells. But uh, extracellular fluid can also be joint fluid, um, spinal fluid eyeball fluid. So there are other places in the body where there's also fluid. Um, the capillary epithelium. So this is the lining of the capillaries and uh, the you know capillaries of the cardiovascular system, but also the capillaries of the lymphatic system, obviously, basically separates your intravascular and extravascular compartments. Um, intravascular being inside a cardiovascular system and lymphatic system, extravascular being outside of that system. And then your cell membranes will separate the intra and extracellular spaces, intracellular being inside the cells, extracellular being everything, all the water that's outside of the cells. Okay, so where do you think most of your body water is contained? Is it inside the cells? Is it between the cells? Or is it in blood plasma? 
And uh, for that question, the majority of your blood, I'm sorry, of your water, of your water is not in blood, it is inside of your cells. So two thirds of your water is actually inside of your cells. All right, so let's talk a little bit about fluid balance. So for water balance to exist in the body to have homeostasis, uh, your intake of water must equal your output. This is pretty, pretty logical and standard. So intake of water of fluid is going to be through drinking and eating. And uh, so, you know, drinking is drinking water, but it's also drinking any other thing that would contain water. And then eating, uh, every food has a certain amount of water in it, uh, some more than others. So if you think like fruits would have more water, fruits and vegetables, probably more water than you know, breads. Um, and then your output is any, the water that's used in metabolic processes. So that's being used up. Uh, it leaves your body all, also through urine, through feces, sweat, and then through your breath. Your breath has a certain amount of humidity. Um, when you, you'll see that if you, if you, for example, stay in a parked car, the, the humidity from your breath will usually fog up the glasses, uh, the windows and stuff. Uh, excess water in your intravascular compartment can shift to then to the extravascular compartment and then into the intracellular. So water is always moving between these compartments. In dehydration, you have an excess loss or a decreased intake of water. And so you don't, you have high osmolality, you just don't have enough water in the system. And the regulators of water balance are going to be uh, the sensation of thirst. Um, and that would obviously kick in when there's dehydration uh, to make you drink more water. Um, also, the electrolyte gradients uh, can help regulate fluid balance, moving water so it's in the proper balance. But even if there is dehydration, it tries to maintain the proper balance between all the different compartments. Um, Antidiuretic hormone, which will make you uh, retain and keep water. Um, so it's, it's pulling it from the urine and putting it back into your cardiovascular system. And of course, the renal control of um, water balance where uh, by um, shedding or keeping sodium ions, it can shed or keep water. So there's a bunch of different regulation systems that help maintain fluid balance. All right, so let's talk a little bit about electrolytes. So electrolytes are charged molecules, therefore they are ions. Uh, the function of electrolytes is going to be the regulation of water distribution in the body, uh, the regulation of osmotic pressure, nerve transmission, so those nerve impulses, you need those electrolytes for those to conduct properly. Uh, cell permeability, so open up uh, pores and channels uh, in and you know, to move out other molecules in and out of cells. And your oxidation reduction reactions uh, along with the maintenance of your blood pH. Your cations or your positively charged ions are sodium, which is mainly found in plasma and interstitial fluid, and potassium, which is mainly found in your cells. Your anions are chloride and bicarb, and um, chloride is mainly found in plasma, uh, and bicarb is found both. Uh, in plasma and inside the cells, with the majority still uh, more of it being inside of your plasma. Uh, your, if you have an electrolyte imbalance, it can be life-threatening. The most common causes of electrolyte imbalances are going to be vomiting and diarrhea, excessive bleeding, and then exudation or oozing um, from burns or other skin injuries where there's a loss of that protective barrier that keeps the, you know, helps keep moisture and water inside of your, your body. So let's talk a little bit about electrolytes and osmosis. So osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration of water through a thermopermeable membrane, uh, which is the cell membrane. And of course it tries to keep an equal water concentration on both sides of the membrane. Uh, osmotic pressure is the physical force that is exerted during osmosis. The more solute particles in a solution, the higher the osmotic pressure. So whichever side of the membrane has the highest concentration of um, other uh, molecules, molecules, solute uh, particles other than water, then uh, it will have the highest osmotic pressure and um, it will actually draw water to itself, okay, to, to where 
that uh, higher osmotic pressure is because it's going to try to, um, you want to balance the concentration of water on both sides uh, in relationship to the solutes that are on both sides of the membrane. So um, the electrolytes concentrations that are measured in serum and plasma uh, can give us some information on what is going on on the balance, but not on the exact volumes because we can't measure everything in every cell in your body. And uh, they always need to be interpreted in the context of your patient's condition. All right, so let's look at another case. Let's look at Jill's case. So Jill is a 20-year-old beach volleyball player. She's been playing all day in a summer tournament. She has been drinking some water and some sports drinks. Um, by the late afternoon, she develops a headache. Her coach encouraged her to drink some more water and some more sports drinks. Jill says that she has been drinking enough, but her coach disagrees. So do you think Jill is dehydrated, and what would you expect her lab results to be? Okay, so your first poll question is, is Jill dehydrated? Do you think yes or no? Um, if you're not sure, like look up what are the signs of dehydration? What is one of the first signs of dehydration? And it's definitely one of her symptoms. And um, then would you expect her lab results to be normal or would you expect them to show a low sodium or low potassium? All right, and so, and likely in her case, her lab results may likely show a low sodium and low potassium because she's probably been sweating a lot. She's exercising all day in a tournament in the heat, in the sun. And so if she's getting that headache, that means she's dehydrated, which means she's probably not taking in enough fluids and especially not taking in elect enough electrolytes. Um, and so... I would expect to see some electrolyte abnormalities for her. So let's talk about the anion gap. That is a calculation that can be done when um, these electrolytes are measured. So um, this is based on the principle that your total anions and cations must equal each other for homeostasis. So the positives and the negatives must balance out. And it's not especially in the kinds, just the amount of positives and the amount of negatives should always be equal. Okay. And so um, to get your anion gap, you take your sodium and your potassium and you add them together. And then you take your chloride and your bicarb and you add them together. So the positives added together, the two negatives added together, and then you subtract the negatives from the positives and that gives you your anion gap. The anion gap will estimate unmeasured anions and cations. So these are anions, cations that you may not have uh, tested for in that a basic metabolic panel or in that comprehensive metabolic panel. Um, these are things like maybe calcium, although calcium is part of a BMP and a CMP, but like magnesium, magnesium is not, although it's very easily measured. So we could very easily measure um, calcium and magnesium. Your phosphates, your phosphates are not part of, um, phosphate levels not part of your BMP or CMP. Sulfates, same thing. Uh, they're not usually not, they're not even measured. You can get a phosphate level. Ketones, Ketones can be measured, but this could be an indication that you need to um, check for ketones. And lactates, um, which are organic acids, lactates can be measured also. Um, when you see an elevated anion gap, you can usually suspect either ketoacidosis or renal diseases. And if you see a decreased anion gap or a negative one, then usually there's a problem with your instrument, instrument error, because you shouldn't normally see that. So let's get into the specific electrolytes. Your first one is going to be sodium. So sodium represents 90% of the plasma cations. So your positively charged ions in plasma, the majority of those is made of sodium. Uh, your main source of sodium is going to be salt. Um, believe it or not, the main source of salt in the American diet is breads. So like, you know, just white bread, um, hot dog buns, and uh, pizza and hamburger buns and pastries and things like that. Uh, the sodium balance in the body is regulated by the kidneys. And um, aldosterone, uh, which is secreted by the adrenal glands, can trigger sodium reabsorption in exchange for potassium. And usually it's 
it's because it's not detected enough sodium in the urine. So you should actually have plenty of sodium in your diet where your body can afford to get rid of it. And there's plenty of it that can leave through the urine. And as long as that's going on, then aldosterone is not needed. But if you don't have enough, then um, that um, sodium is going to be reabsorbed in exchange for potassium. So it'll pull so sodium from the urine and move it back into the cardiovascular system and it will dump potassium. Now, if you're chronically dehydrated, it can also do that. So if you're chronically dehydrated, you'll have antidiuretic hormone that's just going to move water, but you can also have that aldosterone kick in to simply, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reabsorb sodium and raise your sodium level in your blood, but it does it so that it can move water from urine also back into the cardiovascular system. So um, the function of sodium is to maintain the osmotic pressure of the extracellular fluid. So um, this is uh, the osmotic pressure in your interstitial fluid and um, in your plasma and lymphatic fluid. And it is also essential in maintaining acid-base balance in blood viscosity. So also keeping enough water in the cardiovascular system because wherever sodium goes, water follows too. Uh, and then uh, it helps transmit nerve impulses and it assists in muscle contraction, all important functions. So it's a very important to have enough sodium. Uh, but again, then again, not too much, and not too little sodium in the body. So um, therefore, sodium has a narrow reference range um, and any slight changes can have a significant impact on a patient's health. So the clinical, clinical significance of sodium. So hypernatremia is a high sodium level. So it's natremia because um, the uh, element, sodium elements are represented by the symbol Na, so hypernatremia, that's why that's called that. Uh, it is less common, so high sodium levels are not as common. It is seen, however, in severe dehydration and in Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome, you have uh, excessive amounts of sodium are restored because you have excessive aldosterone and excessive cortisol that are being produced in Cushing syndrome. And uh, hyponatremia, which is more commonly seen, so this is not enough hyponatremia, not enough sodium in the blood, um, and it will be seen in cases of decreased intake of sodium, vomiting and diarrhea, that's a very common case, and then sweating, especially sweating due to fever, and ketoacidosis. All of these conditions can lead to hyponatremia, or low sodium levels in the blood. So how do we test for sodium? Um, sodium in most electrolytes are usually tested by uh, ion selective electrodes or IAC. The principle of the IAC as a, a reminder is um, uh, an ion selective electrode will have a semipermeable membranes and then two electrodes, a reference electrode and a sample electrode. And the potential is produced to the due to the different ion concentration on, on either side of that membrane. And the difference in the potential between the two, um, the two, two electrodes can be measured and correlated with the concentration of that ion in the sample. Uh, direct ion selective electrodes use an undiluted sample. They're often seen in point of care um, test cartridges, uh, point of care devices, and um, ABG analyzers. Your indirect ICs use a, direct, a diluted sample sorry, and they are seen, and this is what's used in most large analyzers. So your big chemistry analyzers that have an ion selective electrode for um, the electrolytes are going to use the indirect IC method. The source of error is especially true for the indirect IC um, is that because it uses a diluted sample, it's prone to interference by both high lipids and high protein concentrations. And those uh, substances, so if there's a lot of protein or a lot of lipids, um, they'll display serum or plasma and yield a falsely decreased result, uh, especially in your sodium. The electrodes can get coated by protein from the sample, and that can also become a source of error. Your specimen types for analysis can be whole blood, serum, plasma, uh, usually a lithium, heparin, plasma, so those are the green tops in urine. Whole blood would be usually then done for your point of care, ABG analyzers, et cetera, whereas serum and plasma is usually what's used on your large analyzers. 
So question, you have been sick all night with vomiting and diarrhea. You're slightly dehydrated. Would you expect your sodium to be low or to be high? What do you think? Okay, and for that, I would say it would be more likely for your sodium to be low because you are losing your electrolytes, your, your sodium, through the vomiting and diarrhea as you're losing the fluids. All right, so next we're going to talk about potassium. So potassium is the most abundant intracellular cation, so positively charged ion inside the cells. Uh, and so 98% of the potassium um, in your body is found inside your, your cells, in your intracellular fluids. So the majority, so 98%. So when we do a blood potassium or serum potassium level, we're only measuring 2% of the potassium in your body. Sources of potassium in your diet are going to be mostly from your fruits and veggies. And a function of potassium is to help with muscle activity and to conduct nerve impulses. So again, it works along with sodium to do all of that. And aldosterone is also involved in the kidney's regulation of potassium. Uh, it's more like a indirect or passively. So what happens is if a lot of aldosterone is released because um, the body needs to move the sodium back into the intravascular compartment, then it's going to dump potassium into the urine and you'll end up with low potassium levels. Uh, aldosterone does not move potassium back to the blood. It just, the only thing it does is it dumps potassium into urine. And so there's not a mechanism for you to conserve potassium like there is a mechanism for you to conserve sodium. Therefore, it's really important to get enough potassium and um, some patients that might be on medications, on diuretics that help them dump um, urine and dump extra fluid may have problems keeping their potassium levels up. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical significance of, of uh, potassium. So we'll start with hyperkalemia. Again, um, hyper is high, kaleo or kalemia. So the symbol for potassium is K, and so that's where it comes from. So hyperkalemia, um, high potassium levels can paralyze the heart muscle. It's very interesting. So it can cause the heart muscle to stop beating. And uh, it's actually, that's part of what's in a lethal injection, and that's how they can kill somebody is you can give them a massive overdose of potassium, and it will paralyze and stop the heart. Uh, so will also really low uh, potassium, but that's another issue. It can stop your heart just in a different way. Hyperkalemia occurs when potassium leaves the cell faster than it can be excreted by the kidneys. So this can happen a lot of times in diabetic ketoacidosis when uh, a lot of the hydrogen ions are being moved into the cells to counter, to hide them basically in the cell. And so since they're moving one positively charged ion into the cell, they have to kick one out. And since they have plenty of potassium, they just kick potassium out. So initially you see the spike of potassium, which the kidneys will just dump. And then after that, the patient will have low potassium levels. Hyperkalemia can also be seen in dehydration and shock. And of course, in metabolic or renal tubular acidosis. So uh, as common Metabolic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis is, going to, is a form of metabolic acidosis, which we'll talk about that in the next lesson. Uh, it is worth noting that there's such a thing as artifactual hyperkalemia. So this is artifact, it's fake, and it's because um, uh, if you have high platelet counts, the platelets can release potassium during the clotting process, and then that's not a true um, high potassium and then, of course, you should know by now in hemolyzed specimens, potassium is released from the cells as the red cells are broken, and that will cause a falsely increased potassium in the blood. This is also important to see uh, sometimes in your, your um, patient if it's hemolyzed because of the collection that was difficult, or is it hemolyzed because there's intravascular hemolysis going on in the patient also. Anyway, hypokalemia is a low potassium level. And uh, it can lead to an irregular heartbeat and even, again, stopping of the heart. Uh, low potassium levels or hypokalemia can be caused by a decrease in take in potassium or an increased loss through the kidneys because of high aldosterone levels. 
um, or an increased loss because of vomiting, diarrhea, any GI issues and the use of diuretics because diuretics will make you dump fluid and along with it you're going to dump potassium and your body just doesn't have a way to conserve potassium. So again, the lab procedures for potassium, um, it's ion selective electrode, just like sodium. The semipermeable membrane for potassium is called valinomycin. And again, it's the difference in potential between the reference and the sample electrode is measured and correlates with the uh, concentration in that sample of potassium. The source of error, the most common source of error in potassium is hemolysis especially if it's due to a difficult vena puncture. The release of the potassium ions from the intracellular space then will elevate the uh, serum or plasma value of potassium. Next little question. If you have been sick all night again with vomiting and diarrhea and you're slightly dehydrated, same scenario, would you expect your potassium to be low or to be high? And... The answer to that one is sim simple. It's the same as the other one. It's gonna you expect it to be low for the same reason you would expect the sodium to be low is because those ions can be lost through your um, your fluids, sort of vomiting and the diarrhea. All right, so let's move on and talk about chloride. So um, it, chloride is the anion of highest extracellular concentration, meaning it's a negatively charged ion that you have the most of in your extracellular fluids, such as your plasma um, and interstitial fluid. It helps maintain electrolyte neutrality. So it's basically, it's sodium's buddy. Uh, sodium is positively charged, chloride is negatively charged, and wherever sodium goes, um, chloride is going to follow. And it also uh, moves against bicarb to maintain electrical neutrality in the red cell. This is called a chloride shift. And what happens is in areas of high oxygen or oxygenated red cells, so they've like in the lungs, they just red cells have picked up oxygen, chloride moves to the plasma and gar bicarb can move into the red cell. But, but in areas such as the tissues that have high carbon dioxide content, the carbon dioxide um, will replace the bicarb in the cells. So the bicarb moves out of the cells and therefore the chloride um, will move um, so into the cell from the plasma. So I had to get them straight there. I don't have my little diagram. So anyway, uh, bicarb and chloride play switcheroo back and forth depending if you're at the lungs or at the tissues. And so this is a very important function because it allows the body to transport carbon dioxide to the lungs and maintain electrical neutrality in the red cells uh, in uh, adequate homeostasis and balance. Um, so again, the two main functions of Cora is going to maintain osmotic pressure in fluids, uh, especially your extracellular fluids and uh, electrical neutrality uh, in uh, the, that, those fluids and of course in the red cell. Um, usually the same conditions that will lead to hypernatremia or high potassium levels will lead to hyperchloremia and conditions that cause hyponatremia will cause hypochloremia. So again, because they move together as, bu as buddies, if sodium is high, chloride will be high. If sodium is low, chloride will be low. Uh, the lab procedure for chloride is also by ion selective electrode. Um, the specimen types are serum, plasma, and a whole blood, and also urine. Um, also worth noting that you can do chlorides on spinal fluids. So chloride in spinal fluid has a higher concentration than in serum due to the lower protein concentration in spinal fluids. Um, in bacterial meningitis, there's a higher protein concentration and therefore the chloride concentration will be lower than the reference range for spinal fluid for uh, chloride. Sweat chloride, they, again, although testing for cystic fibrosis has been replaced by genetic testing, Sweat chloride testing can is still be performed at some institutions, and patients that have cystic fibrosis will simply have higher levels of chloride in their sweat. The sources of error in testing, there's a potential source of error in chloride testing. It's going to be the presence of chlorine from tap water on glassware or within the analyzers that are used for chlor chloride testing. And usually what happens is 
your analyzers that need water will have, they'll be hooked to a, a millipore or a filtering system where this is usually not a problem, unless of course the, the filtering system is um, you know, deficient or there's something wrong with the filtering system and it's allowing chlorinated water to enter the system. All right, so um, a little bit of review. Where is sodium the most abundant? Is it inside the cells, between the cells, or in blood plasma? Select whichever answer you think or answers you think is the most appropriate. It's almost the same question. Where is potassium the most abundant? Is it inside the cells, between the cells, or in blood plasma? Same three location. So select what you think. Um, and again, for that, Where's most of the potassium? Inside the cells. Where's most of the sodium? Inside uh, the blood, blood or plasma, but also in the interstitial uh, fluid around the cells, just not inside the cells. All right, so we're going to move on to bicarbonate. It is an extracellular anion. So again, meaning there's more bicarb outside of the cells than there is inside the cells. Uh, it is also known as total carbon dioxide in your basic metabolic panel and comprehensive meta metabolic panels. So total uh, carbon dioxide is actually a measurement of bicarb. And this is basically uh, because 90% of the carbon dioxide in the blood is actually bicarb or in the form of bicarb. So the measure of total carbon dioxide is an approximate measure of the bicarb. So just keep that in mind. And you'll see that if you run an ABG and run the CMP that the total CO2 on the CMP or the BMP and the actual bicarb measurement on the ABG results will be really close to each other. The forms that you can find bicarb in the blood are going to be as dissolved carbon dioxide, as carbon dioxide bound to proteins, as bicarb ions and carbonic acid. Those are all the different forms of it. And although it is filtered by the kidneys, all the bicarb is restored because it's useful and the body needs it for acid-base balance, uh, unless there's too much of it and then it can be dumped in, uh, in urine. Um, CO2 is removed from the body through the process of exhalation. So uh, basically CO2, um, we're going to cover this in the respiratory chapter, but basically CO2 and the tissues is converted to bicarb and hydrogen ion and then it's carried in the blood and then it's converted from bicarbonate hydrogen ions back to CO2 and breathed out. But we'll go over that later. Not in this lesson, in, a, in another lesson. So the clinical significance of bicarb is really important acid-base imbalance or acid-base balance, basically. Um, and we are going to cover that in the next lesson. So acid-base imbalances will have a dramatic effect on the bicarb concentration, if, especially if the imbalance is of metabolic origin. Um, the levels of bicarb and carbon dioxide can assist in determining the cause of the acid-base imbalance, but of course other tests or results are needed as well. Uh, again, that's the subject for the next lesson. Metabolic alkalosis is the most common ca cause of an elevated bicarb level, and metabolic acidosis is the most common cause or associated with a decreased bicarb level. So uh, bicarb is a major component of the blood buffering system, meaning it uh, helps to maintain the pH of the blood. And along with chloride, it helps maintain electrical neutrality in that red cell, part of that chloride shift where bicarb and chloride shift back and forth depending on the oxygen concentration and CO2 concentration uh, at the site. So how is bicarb measured? So by ion selective electrodes in your ABG analyzers, it utilizes the membrane that allows carbon dioxide gas to pass through the membrane into a bicarbonate solution and then hydrogen ions are produced, which then lower the pH of the solution, and the pH change is used to calculate the bicarb concentration. So you basically, it's a pH um, ISC, it's a pH electrode that's used, and the bicarb is actually a calculated value. The enzymatic methods is what you will see in your big analyzers. Um, it converts all the carbon dioxide into bicarb, and then the bicarbonate is converted to oxaloacetic acid, and then this reaction is coupled with an NADH reaction for detection. Um, and so those are commonly used. Uh, colorimetric methods are not as common. 
and a source of errors is running specimens that have been exposed to air as carbon dioxides dissipate in the, in the air and then will that would affect it will uh, falsely lower some of the results next we're going to talk a little bit about lithium because it is an ion uh, it is not a normally measured ion so you would only measure lithium on patients that are actually taking lithium and lithium is given as a drug to treat bipolar disorders it will enhance the reuptake of neurotransmitters that produce a calming effect um, and so it's basically going to lower the excitatory neurotransmitters and raise the calming neurotransmitters like GABA. Uh, there is a narrow therapeutic window for lithium, which is why you might need to measure it in the lab. Uh, it is therapeutic between 0 0.6 and 1.2 millimoles per liter. Uh, anything greater than 2 is toxic greater than 2.5 will give muscle rigidity and epileptic seizures and greater than five can lead to, to death. So um, some of your ER patients, you know, if they're known to be bipolar, bipolar, you may have to get a lithium level on them. A quick review of colligative properties of solutions. Those are the physical properties that depend on the ratio of the number of solute particles to the number of solvent molecules in a solution. So how concentrated that solution is. It is not based on what the solute or the solvent is. Um, examples of the colligative properties of solution are the osmotic pressure, the freezing point, the boiling point, and the vapor pressure. And we use the freezing point in the lab to uh, measure osmolality. So what do you think would increase the osmolality of plasma? So just think of the molecules that are abundant in plasma. And uh, an excess of those molecules would then, of course, increase that osmolality. So um, list a molecule and, um, and that would cause uh, an increase in osmolality if it was in excess. So let's review um, osmotic pressure and osmolality. So osmosis is the movement of water across a membrane. Um, for example, uh, an example of osmosis is the lysis of red cells in a hypotonic solution. This is why in blood bank you use saline and you don't use distilled water. If you put your cells in distilled water, all your little red cells are going to burst into pieces in lice and you won't have any cells to test. Osmolality is a measure of the number of solute particles per unit of solvent. It does not tell you the identity of those solute particles, just how many solute particles there are per unit of solvent. Um, Concentrated substances always have a high osmolality. Very dilute specimens will have a low osmolality. And antidiuretic hormone does have an influence here. So um, if the osmolality of blood increases, antidiuretic hormone is going to be secreted. Uh, and that will increase the resorption of water in the collecting duct for the kidneys and put water back into plasma and concentrate that urine. And it will also stimulate the thirst mechanism. So this is something that would kick in if you were dehydrated or, you know, needed to conserve some fluids um, or obviously drink some fluids. There is a calculated versus a measured osmolality. And uh, there are several formulas for the calculated osmolality. And then measurement is measured by freezing point uh, depression. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. So in a person like Jill that's slowly getting dehydrated, her osmolality will still read in a normal range, but you would expect uh, her osmolality to be higher than her normal value or trending towards the higher end of normal or lower than her normal value or trending towards the lower end of normal. And this would be measuring it in blood. So it is good to specify that because you could... Uh, measure it in blood or in urine, so um, serum or urine. So let's say her serum osmolality, what would you think it would be? Would it be higher or lower than normal or than her normal? Anyway, so let's look at the clinical significance then of osmolality. So your reference ranges for measured osmolality, measured by freezing point depression, uh, for serum, it's 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kilograms. For urine, it's 300 to 900 milliosmoles per kilogram. When physicians order these tests, they often order it in serum and urine to check uh, uh, the concentrating ability of the kidneys. 
to see if the kidneys are able to concentrate the urine adequately or to check to see if there's presence of unmeasured substances. Um, so uh, osmolality of serum it will be affected by poisons such as ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, and methanol, which is a form of alcohol that you should not drink. Uh, but you know, that's moonshine. Uh, medications can also affect it and diseases. Uh, any va value less than 240 milliosmoles per kilogram or greater than 320 milliosmoles per kilogram will require immediate inter intervention by the medical staff because these are very dangerous. Um, hyperosmolar conditions or conditions that would cause reading uh, higher than um, the upper you know, value for serum here are diabetes insipidus caused by a deficiency of antidiuretic hormones so uh, they do not know it they don't they can't concentrate their urine so the kidneys cannot resorb the water and so that leads to the production of large amounts of really dilute urine um, and loss of vast amounts of water through the kidneys and then the blood becomes hyperosmotic the, the blood is kind of like dehydrated because it's just all leaving the body and then hypoosmolar conditions or conditions that would cause, cause these uh, serum readings to be below 275 would be when excessive amounts of antidiuretic hormones are secreted, uh, the opposite occurs. So you would have really concentrated urine and very dilute blood. Um, and so that would be a hypo or very dilute blood. Osmometers. Um, or what you use to measure the osmolality of serum in urine specimens. Uh, in the lab, we commonly use, again, freezing point depression. The sample is super cool to a temperature below its freezing point. A stirring rod causes the crystals to form, releasing the heat of fusion. Uh, the heat of fusion raises the temperature back to its freezing point, and the temperature change is measured by a thermistor and converted to milliosmoles per kilogram. And this is as, compo as compared to the, of course, the normal freezing point of like water is kind of like that's the standard, but um, yeah, and the more concentrated a solution is, then the lower its freezing point is going to be. This is the same principle we talked about, about why you can salt the sidewalks and keep it from icing because it lowers the freezing point of water. A little bit about fluid imbalances. Let's look at what's going on with the lymphatic system. So um, the lymph system is really important to fluid balance. So lymph fluid is composed of proteins and other fluids. Um, it is initially blood or plasma basically that has leaked out of the blood capillaries into the tissue bed along with us, other substances. It's just as, you know, there could be some bacteria in there, uh, in lymph, uh, some cancer cells, um, and there's, you know, could be some more protein molecules and, you know, ions, all of that can be part of lymph. Um, so initially when plasma leaves the blood capillaries and bays the t cells of the tissue and the, those cells take the components and water and things that it needs, then um, the fluid that's left, some of it is pulled back into the cardiovascular system on the venous end and enters back into the cardiovascular system. And then some that's left behind gets pushed into the lymphatic system. So the endothelial cells or the lining 